Okay, so this is entitled, chapter seven is called Monsignor in Town. Now, you're going to have to really be patient and work hard through the first part of this chapter. This chapter is particularly difficult initially because it's called Monsignor in Town and there are actually two different people referred to by this one title, Monsignor. Okay, first of all, uh, most importantly, we, we are introduced to a new character named the Marquis Saint Evremond, which means this is a very important uh, nobleman in Paris. And we meet him in this chapter. And uh, for the purposes of like that quiz where you're going to have to match up chapter titles with what is happening, you'll need to know that the Monseigneur in town is referring to the events that take place when the Marquis Saint Evermond is in Paris. The next chapter is called Monseigneur in the Country. And then you'll need to know that that is when we follow this Marquis Saint Evermond as he leaves Paris and makes his way to his fancy house out in the country. He is a very wealthy nobleman uh, who owns vast acreage and he's going to be extremely important in this book. Now, initially, Monseigneur in the town is referring to this very, very high up aristocrat who um, is hosting a party at his palatial home in Paris. He has invited many guests to his home, one of which is the Marquis Saint Evermond. He's the only guy that we need to be concerned about in this chapter. So if, you, if you're just hopelessly confused, it's okay. It's going to be all right. Now, in chapter seven, when we open, um, Dickens is going to be really trying to let us readers know that all of the aristocrats at this time, all of them were completely self-seeking, self-serving, um, they were very corrupt individuals. They were greedy and they lived to please themselves. It kind of sounds like a lot of American society, honestly. Um, so anyway, the Marquis, the Marquis St. Evermond comes to this reception of the Monseigneur, probably hoping to regain his favor. Uh, the Monseigneur is higher in social rank than the Marquis but they are both arrogant, cold aristocrats, products of their society. They both exploit the system they were born into with the same disregard for the welfare of others. Okay, and you will be underlining a lot and writing even more in this chapter. If you can't keep up with the annotations, that's okay. Um, on Wednesday, after you take your vocabulary quiz, you will have the opportunity to make uh, the annotations that you couldn't keep up with. Monseigneur in town. Monseigneur, one of the great lords in power at the court, held his fortnightly reception in his grand hotel in Paris. Monseigneur was in his inner room, his the sanctuary, sanctuary of sanctuaries. Of holiest, of holiest to the crowd of worshippers in the suite of rooms without. Monseigneur was about to take his chocolate. Monseigneur could swallow a great many things with ease, and was, by some few sullen minds, supposed to be rather rapidly swallowing crumbs. But his morning's chocolate could not so much as get into the throat of Monseigneur without the, the aid, aid of four, of four strong, strong men. men. Okay, so taking chocolate is actually a very trivial, unimportant, uncomplicated act. Having four men for that job emphasizes the horrible waste of the system and the decadence of the powerful ruling class. This is not hyperbole on Dickens's part. Uh, a person of this immense wealth would have had four different servants. It would take four different servants to give him his hot chocolate in the morning. Yes, 
It took four men, all four ablaze with gorgeous decoration, and the chief of them, unable to exist with fewer than two gold watches in his pocket, emulative of the noble and chaste fashion set by Monseigneur, to conduct the happy chocolate to Monseigneur's lips. One lackey carried the chocolate pot into the sacred presence. A second milled and frothed the chocolate with the little instrument he bore for that function. A third presented the favoured napkin. A fourth, he of the two gold watches, poured the chocolate out. It was impossible for Monseigneur to dispense with one of these attendants on the chocolate and hold his high place under the admiring heavens. Deep would have been the blot upon his escutcheon if his chocolate had been ignobly waited on by only three men. He must have died of two. Monseigneur had been out at a little supper last night where the comedy and the grand opera were charmingly represented. Monseigneur was out at a little supper most nights with fascinating company. So polite and so impressible was Monseigneur that the comedy and the grand opera had far more influence with him in the tiresome articles of state affairs and state secrets than the needs of all France. A happy circumstance for France, as the life always is for all countries similarly favoured, always was for England, by way of example, in the regretted days of the Mary Stuart. And so, Monseigneur had only one truly noble idea of general public business which was to let everything go on in its own way. Of particular public business, Monseigneur had the other truly noble idea that it must all go its way, tend to his own power and pocket. Of his pleasures, general and particular, Monseigneur had the other truly noble idea that the world was made for him. Underline that the world was made for them. That's a superscript too. And at the bottom of your page, you should write attitude of aristocrats. This was the attitude of all aristocrats, is that the world and everything in it existed for their pleasure. The text of his order, altered from the original by only a pronoun, which is not much, ran, the earth and the fullness thereof are mine, said Monsignor. Okay, please underline that allusion to the Bible. The earth and the fullness thereof are mine, saith Monsignor. Now, in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, where this verse is found, it reads, The earth and the fullness thereof are mine, saith the Lord. So you see here that um, the aristocrats, in this case, this specific monsignor, spurns the supremacy of God and actually believes that he is the one for whom all pleasure exists. So he's changed the ownership from the Lord to himself. Now, this next paragraph is really hard to understand, and I'm going to try to explain it to you. I'm just going to tell you up front that we've already seen how the Monsignor and all aristocrats of the time spurned the supremacy of God and really put themselves in the place of being overall people uh, underneath them and uh, owning great uh, fortunes. Well, in this next paragraph, it's talking about this man, this Monsignor that's hosting this party, how uh, he even removed his sister from a convent. You know, that's where a woman would have uh, married herself into the Catholic Church, uh, married herself to Jesus. That's what I think they believe. And um, it's a very sacred, it's a lifetime vow that this woman would have taken. Well, he removes his sister from a convent in order to gain a lot of money through her marriage to a wealthy member of the Farmer General. The Farmer General was an organization whose members lived off of the very high taxes charged to the lowest, uh, to the common people who could not afford to pay them. Yet, Monsignor had slowly found that vulgar embarrassments crept into his affairs, both private and public, and he had, as to both classes of affairs, allied himself perforce with a farmer general. A farmer general as to finance is public, because Monsignor could not make anything at all of them, and must consequently let them out to somebody who could. As to finance is private, because farmer generals were rich, and Monsignor, after generations of great luxury and expense, was grown poor. Hence, Monsignor had taken his sister from a convent, while there was yet time to ward off the intended veil, cheapest garment she could wear, and had bestowed her as a prize upon a very rich farmer general, poor in family, which farmer general, 
carrying an appropriate cane with a golden apple on the top of it, was now among the company in the outer rooms, much prostrated before by mankind, always accepting superior mankind of the blood of Monseigneur, who, his own wife included, looked down upon him with the loftiest contempt. A sumptuous man was the Father General. Thirty horses stood in his stables. Twenty-four male domestics sat in his halls. Six body women waited on his wife. As one who pretended to do nothing but plunder and forage where he could, the Father General, howsoever his matrimonial relations conduced to social morality, was at least the greatest reality among the personages who attended at the Hotel of Monseigneur that day. For the rooms, though a beautiful scene to look at and adorned with every device of decoration that the taste and skill of the time could achieve, were, in truth, not a sound business, considered with any reference to the scarecrows and the rags and nightcaps elsewhere, and not so far off either, but that the watching towers of Notre Dame, almost equidistant from the two extremes, could see them both, they would have been an exceedingly uncomfortable business, if that could have been anybody's business at the house of Monseigneur. Military officers destitute of military knowledge, naval officers with no idea of a ship, civil officers without a notion of affairs, brazen ecclesiastics of the worst world worldly, with sensual eyes, loose tongues, and looser lives, or all totally, totally unfit, unfit for their several, for their calling, several all callings, all lying horribly in pretending to belong to them, but all nearly or remotely of the order of Monseigneur, and therefore foisted on all public employments from which anything was to be gone. These were to be told off by the score and the score. People not immediately connected with Monseigneur or the state, yet equally unconnected with anything that was real or with lives passed in traveling by any straight road to any true earthly end, were no less abundant. Okay, so all of that was telling us that all of these officials, the naval officers with no, with no knowledge at all of ships, uh, military officers who had never had any military training. All of these officials had been given their jobs or their titles without respect to any knowledge or merit. Now, in the rest of this long paragraph, you're going to circle the different types of people who attend uh, at the hotel of the rich noble, the first Monseigneur, the one that we're not really worried about specifically. Please circle doctors. Doctors who made great fortunes out of dainty remedies for imaginary disorders that never existed smiled upon their courtly patients in the antechambers of Monseigneur. Projectors who discovered every kind of remedy for the little evils with which the state was touched, except the remedy of setting to work in earnest to root out a single sin, poured their distracting babble into any ears they could lay hold of at the reception of Monseigneur. Unbelieving, Unbelieving philosophers, philosophers who were remodeling the world with words and making card towers of Babel to scale the skies with, talked with unbelieving, unbelieving chemists, chemists who had an eye on the transmutation of metals at this wonderful gathering accumulated by Monseigneur. Exquisite, Exquisite gentleman, gentleman of the finest breeding, which was at that remarkable time and has been since to have been known by its fruits of indifference to every natural subject of human interest, were in the most exemplary state of exhaustion at the Hotel of Monseigneur. Such homes had these various notabilities left behind them in the fine world of Paris, that the spies among the assembled devotees of Monseigneur, forming a goodly half of the polite company, would have found it hard to discover among the angels of that sphere one solitary wife who in her manners and appearance owned to being a mother. Okay, please put a square around the word mother. And that is a really interesting sentence because Dickens is telling us that among the aristocrats, um, you would have, it would have been very, very hard to find a single mother, a single woman who was proud of her motherhood. Instead of being proud and raising her children, most aristocratic mothers just um, pushed them off on their nannies who would raise them. And it sounds, again, like um, a lot of mothers in America. Unfortunately, an increasing amount of mother, mothers in America who um, don't really, are not really devoted to their children, but just push them off on various babysitters, including technology. Indeed, except for the mere act of bringing a troublesome creature into this world, which does not go far towards the realization of the name mother, there was no such thing 
known to the fashion. Peasant women kept the unfashionable babies close and brought them up, and charming grandmamas of 60 dressed and sucked as at 20. Circle the leprosy of unreality. Disfigured every human creature in attendance upon Monsignor. Okay, and there will be an annotation that you will write. Uh, leprosy is a disease that eats away at uh, appendages like ears, nose, uh, hands, feet. And so this leprosy uh, suggests a disease eating away at the structure of the aristocracy itself. And that would be self-absorption and greed. Those two things disfigure the hearts and minds of the aristocrats and make them incredibly insensitive to the plight of the poor people all around them. In the outermost room were half a dozen exceptional people who had had for a few years some vague misgiving in them that things in general were going rather wrong. As a promising way of setting them right, half of the half dozen had become members of a fantastic sect of convulsions and were even then considering within themselves whether they should foam, rage, roar, and turn cataleptic on the spot, thereby setting up a highly intelligible finger post to the future for Monseigneur's guidance. Besides these dervishes were other three who had rushed into another sect, which mended matters with a jargon about the center of truth, holding that man had got out of the center of truth, which did not need much demonstration, but had not got out of the circumference, and that he was to be kept from flying out of the circumference, and was even to be shoved back into the center by fasting and seeing of spirits. Among these, accordingly, much discoursing with spirits went on, and it did a world of good which never became manifest. Okay, and so in this next paragraph, Dickens is going to be criticizing the aristocracy because even though there are problems all around them that they should be concerned about, they are not, and they're just uh, concerned about how they're dressing. But the comfort was that all, all the company, company at the Grand Hotel of Monseigneur were perfectly, perfectly dressed. dressed. If the day of judgment had only been ascertained to be addressed then, everybody there would have been eternally correct. Such frizzling and powdering and sticking up of hair such delicate complexions artificially preserved and mended, such gallant swords to look at, and such delicate honor to the sense of smell would surely keep anything going, forever and ever. The exquisite gentlemen of the finest breeding wore little pendant trinkets that chinked as they languidly moved. These golden fetters rang like precious little bells, and what with that ringing, and with the rustle of silk and brocade and fine linen, there was a flutter in the air that fanned St. Antoine and his devouring hunger far away. Dress, Dress was the one unfailing talisman and charm used, used for, for keeping, keeping all, all things, things in their places. Everybody was dressed for a fancy ball that was never to leave off. From the palace of the Tuileries, through Monseigneur and the whole court, through the chambers, the tribunals of justice, and all society except the scarecrows, the fancy ball descended to the common executioner who, in pursuance of the charm, was required to officiate frizzled, powdered, in a gold-laced coat, pumps, and white silk stockings. At the gallows and the wheel, the axe was a rarity, Monsieur Paris, as it was the episcopal mode among his brother professors of the provinces, Monsieur Orléans, and the rest, to call him, presided in this dainty dress. And who among the company at Monseigneur's reception in that 1780th year of our Lord could possibly doubt? that a system rooted in a frizzled hangman, powdered, gold-laced, pump, and white silk stocking, would see the very stars out. Monseigneur, having eased his four men of their burdens and taken his chocolate, caused the doors of the holiest of holiest to be thrown at them and issued forth. Okay, so in these next two paragraphs, this is where it really kind of gets interesting. Uh, so this Monseigneur who is giving this party at his hotel he, at this time, is going to go out and see his guests because the party is over. Now, we're about to meet the Marquis that we are really concerned about. Then, what submission, what cringing and fawning, what civility, what abject humiliation. As to bowing down in body and spirit, nothing in that way was left for heaven, which may have been one, among other reasons, why the worshippers of Monseigneur never troubled. Bestowing a word of promise here and a smile there 
a whisper on one happy sleigh and a wave of the hand on another. Monsignor Abbott would pass through his room his in the remote region of the circumference of truth. There, Monsignor, Monsignor turned, turned and, came and came back, back again. again. And so, in due course of time, got himself shut up in his sanctuary by the chocolate sprites and was seen no more. Okay, so with this, we're done with that uh, first Monsignor, and we never see him again uh, throughout the book. So what we are very much focused now on is the Marquis Saint Evermond, and from now on, we're always going to think of him as the Monsignor in the town, and later on, Monsignor in the country. Pay very, uh, very much attention to this. Now, I'm just going to give you a hint. Before we get the description of this marquee, you just need to know that he is extremely angry. He's angry because he attended this party at the hotel, probably hoping to get a favor out of this Monseigneur or to regain um, the, the friendship with this man that he once enjoyed. But we can tell that he's been rejected and apparently when the Monsignor came out and greeted the guest, he did not pay any attention at all to this Marquis. And this Marquis is livid. He is very angry, but of course, being an aristocrat, he is very well bred. And so he doesn't show anger like we might see anger if we were to walk the halls of our high school because he has been uh, extremely well bred. So his anger comes out differently as you will see. The show being over, the flutter in the air became quite a little storm, and the precious little bells went ringing downstairs. There was soon but one, one person, person left of all the crowd, and he, with his hat under his arm and his snuff box in his hand, slowly passed among the mirrors on his way out. I and devote moment, you, said this person, stopping at the last door on his way and turning in the direction of the sanctuary. To the, the devil. devil. Okay, I think you can um, figure out in modern day language what he was saying uh, to the closed door where the Monsignor had retreated. Uh, he's saying something ugly to the guy that he... Uh... With that, he shook the snuff from his fingers as if he had shaken the dust from his feet and quietly walked downstairs. He was a man of about 60, 60 handsomely dressed, dressed haughty, and with a face like a fine mask. And that's going to be important. Underline haughty in manner. That means stuck up, very conceited and arrogant. And a face like a fine mask. Because he is so well bred, he has a poker face in the extreme. He does not show. He keeps a calm exterior. Um, and so even though he is angry, the average person would not be able to tell that. However, the driver of his carriage, who has probably driven for him many years, can tell by some way, maybe the way he's walking, maybe the way he's holding his mouth, he can tell that the marquee is angry and that's going to be important. So at the bottom of your page, please write description of marquee. The face of transparent paleness. Every feature in it clearly defined, one set expression on it. The nose, beautifully formed otherwise, was very slightly pinched at the top of each nostril. In those two compressions or tints, the only little change that the face ever showed resulted. They persisted in changing color sometimes, and they would be occasionally dilated and contracted by something like a faint pulsation. Then they gave a look of treachery and cruelty to the whole countenance. countenance. Examined with attention, its capacity of helping such a look was to be found in the line of the mouth and the lines of the orbits of the eyes being much too horizontal and thin. Still, in the effect the face made, it was a, it was handsome, a handsome face and a remarkable one. Okay, and with your green pen, above the word countenance that you underlined up there, would you please write that that means face? Countenance is a, an important word to know. So, and at the top of your page, uh, page 110, you can write with your green pen, though handsome, he has a cold personality. Now is where we really want to pay attention to the actions of this guy, the Marquis Saint Evermont. 
Its owner went downstairs into the courtyard, brought into his carriage, and drove away. Not many people had talked with him at the reception. He had stood in a little space apart, and Monseigneur might have been warmer in his manner. It appeared under the circumstances rather agreeable to him to see the common people dispersed before his horses, and often barely escaping from being run down. Okay, so that told us why the Marquis is angry, because he uh, not not very many people talked to him at this party, and certainly the head Monseigneur, whose hotel it was, he certainly did not talk to the Marquis. And so when his driver sees the Marquis walking out of the hotel, he can tell, oh, the Marquis is angry. And um, so the driver is going to drive recklessly. And the only way I can explain that is, you know what it's like. You've probably ridden with someone. I hope not, but I bet you might have. Uh, you've probably ridden with someone who is angry. And boy, when they're angry, they just stomp on the gas and they, um, they like to hear the tires squeal and, and that kind of stuff. That is exactly what's going on. His driver is driving recklessly through town and this is going to be important. You and I imagine a driver driving through the streets of Huntsville and we imagine the sidewalks on either side of the road, but that was not the case in that day in Paris or London. They would have streets and right on the street front would be shops and businesses and homes. In other words, there was no sidewalk at all. And what this, what this is telling us is that as the driver recklessly races down the street and turns corners quickly, it gives the marquee pleasure to see people desperately trying to get out of the road before they're run over. It gives him pleasure. I heard something weird in the hall. Okay. His man drove as if he were charging an enemy, and the furious recklessness of the man brought no check into the face or to the lips of the master. Okay, so underline his man, talking about the driver, drove as if he were charging an enemy, and the furious recklessness, underline those things, it tells us that it brought no check into the face or to the lips of the master. That means that the marquee did not correct his driver and tell him to settle down and drive in a sane manner. The complaint that sometimes made itself audible, even in that deaf city and dumb age, that in the narrow streets without footways, the fierce patrician custom of hard driving endangered and maimed the mere vulgar in a barbarous manner. But few cared enough for that to think of it a second time. And in this matter, as in all others, the common wretches were left to get out of their difficulties as they could. With a wild rattle and clatter, and an inhuman abandonment of consideration not easy to be understood in these days, the carriage dashed through streets and swept round corners, with women screaming before it and men clutching each other and clutching children out of its way. At last, swooping at a street corner by a fountain, one of its wheels came to a sickening little jolt, and there was a loud cry from a number of voices, and the horses reared and plunged. Okay, so can you tell that the carriage ran over something? What's the word that would tell us that? Jolt. That tells us when it jolt, when the wheel jolted, and then there's a loud, a loud cry from a lot of people, and the horses reared and plunged. And then underline in the next line, inconvenience, and see if you can tell me the reason and the only reason that the driver even stops. But for the latter inconvenience, the carriage probably would not have stopped. Carriages were often known to drive on and leave their wounded behind. And why not? But the frightened valet had got down in a hurry, and there were 20 hands at the horse's bridles. Okay. So, can you tell what caused the carriage to stop? The horse is rearing. That's the only reason that the driver got down quickly and to check on the horses. He's not worried about what he must have run over. He's worried about the horses. What has gone wrong? Said Monsieur, calmly looking out. A tall, a tall man, man in a nightcap had caught up a bundle from among the feet of the horses and had laid it on the basement of the fountain and was down in the mud and wet, howling over it like a wild animal. Oh, that's sad. 
So this tall man has picked up a bundle, something from among the feet of the horses, whatever was laid, uh, whatever was run over. And he has laid it on the basement of the fountain and he is down on his hands and knees in the mud, howling over it like a wild animal. Pardon, Monsieur the Marquis, said a ragged and submissive man. It is a child. Okay, I don't know about you, but I can, well, I think I do. I think if we were all, if, if all of us were down at the fair on the square and a car just came crazy driving fast down the street and ran over a person, I can guarantee you that all of us around, all of us, would be very angry at the driver and we would be yelling and we'd be trying to, you know, we'd be saying, what in the world are you doing? Well, not this crowd. They are angry also, but they are described as submissive. And you're going to see in a moment that when the driver, when the marquee talks to these people, they have their head bowed, they do not make eye contact, and they certainly answer not a word. Why does he make that abominable noise? Is it his child? Excuse me, Monsieur the Marquis, it is a pity. Yes. And so now we find out why that tall man was howling like a wild animal, because he saw his own child get run over. The fountain was a little removed, for the street opened where it was into a space some 10 or 12 yards square. As the tall man suddenly got up from the ground and came running at the carriage, Monsieur the Marquis clapped his hand for an instant on his sword hilt. Okay, so the father of that child starts running towards the Marquis's carriage, and when he starts running towards the carriage, the Marquis instantly puts his hand on his sword hilt and uh, would think nothing of uh, hewing this man down. A killed! shrieked the man in wild desperation, extending both arms at their length above his head and staring at him. Dead! Okay, so no one cried because they were all afraid of the Marquis. They're certainly not protesting. They are just being silent, except for the father of the child. And he's saying, killed, dead. The people closed round and looked at Monsieur the Marquis. There was nothing revealed by the many eyes that looked at him but watchfulness and eagerness. See, all of the crowd is getting closer. They're just, they're, they're walking closer so that they can hear every word that is exchanged. But notice that the only thing that describes them, not anger, just watchfulness and eagerness. They are going to be very careful not to display any anger towards this marquee who has run over this child. There was no visible menacing or anger. Neither did the people say anything. After the first cry, they, they had been, been silent, silent and they, and they remained so. so. The voice of the submissive man who had spoken was flat and tame in its extreme submission. Monsieur the Marquis ran his eyes over them all as if they had been mere rats come out of their holes. Love, this is why I wish I were here today, because this animal imagery, you know, last time we had the lion and the jackal. This time we're going to have the rats, and I love this. And you need to be thinking of every characteristic you know associated with rats. Why does Dickens choose rats, the filthiest, vulgarest, disgusting animal, scavenger? Why does he have rats? represent these desperately poor, mistreated, hungry, starving people. So I hope you are seeing, I hope you're imagining the contempt, the utter hatred, the marquee, the, the man who's so wealthy and has everything, the contempt and hatred he feels for these common people. To him, they are nothing more than rats come out of their holes. He, he took out his purse. It is extraordinary to me, said he, that you people cannot take care of yourselves and your children. One or the other of you is forever in the way. How do I know what injury you have done my horses? See, give him that. And surely the Marquis is feeling like he is an extremely generous man. 
he complains and he says, you people, you don't even take care of your children and yourselves. Some One of you is always getting in the way of, of, of me. How do I know what injury you have done my horses? That's what he is most concerned about. Certainly not the death of this child. And now in a moment of generosity, I don't know the reason he does it, but he takes out a gold coin because gold is nothing to him. And he tosses it out into the crowd as if that will make up for the life that he has taken. He threw out a gold coin for the valley to pick up, and all the heads craned forward, that all the eyes might look down at it as it fell. The tall man called out again with a most unearthly cry. And underline tall man, please. And now another person in the crowd is going to come up to the tall man and try to comfort him. We know the person already. We know his name. We've met him before, the comforter. He was arrested by the quick arrival of another man for whom the rest made way. On seeing him, the miserable creature fell upon his shoulder, sobbing and crying, and pointing to the fountain where some women were stooping over the motionless bundle and moving gently about it. They were as silent, however, as the men. I know all. I know all, said that last comer. Be a brave man, my Gaspar. It is better for the poor little plaything to die so than to live. It has died in a moment without pain. Could it have lived an hour as happily? Okay, so ooh, lots of good stuff here. And so uh, this comforter says, be a brave man, my Gaspard. Circle Gaspard. We've seen that name Gaspard before. If you'll look on page 29, this is, turn back if you will to page 29. This is the tall man who, uh, oh, I thought it was 29. Uh, I think it's actually 30. Maybe it's 29, 30. But this is the tall man who wrote the word blood on the outside of the wine shop a long time ago. And when this comforter is talking to Gaspard, whose child has been killed, this comforter says, hey, you ought to be glad your child died. It died in an instant. It's, it's feeling no more pain. And I love this question he asks, could it have lived an hour as happily? We can't even imagine that. But um, in, in other countries of the world, I think that that would even be true today, that it's possible and probable that there are countries where a child could never even have one hour of happiness in his life because of hunger, war, etc. You are a philosopher, you there, said the Marquis, smiling. How do they call you? They call me Defarge. Of what trade? Monsieur the Marquis, vendor of wine. Pick up that philosopher and vendor of wine, said the Marquis, throwing him another gold coin, and spend it as you will. The horses there, are they right? So I guess I don't know what impulse prompts the Marquis who has such wealth to toss another gold coin. And this time he tosses it to Mr. Defarge. Perhaps uh, he's enjoying his conversation with Gaspard. I don't really know. But he is most concerned, again, about his horses. Now pay really close attention. I wish I were in person for this paragraph. Without deigning to look at the assemblage a second time, Monsieur the Marquis leaned back in his seat and was just being driven away with the air of a gentleman who had accidentally broken some common thing and had paid for it, and could afford to pay for it, when his ease was suddenly disturbed by a coin flying into his carriage and ringing on its floor. Did you catch what happened? Someone threw that coin back into the carriage of the Marquis. And of course, by throwing that coin back into the carriage, they are saying we don't want anything connected with you they are shaming him they are uh, making it clear that they are contemptuous of him hold said monsieur the marquis hold the horses who threw that he looked to the spot where defarge the vendor of wine had stood a moment before but the wretched father was groveling on his face on the pavement in that spot and the figure that stood beside him was the figure of a dark, stout woman, knitting. Oh dear. And so we know who this woman is who is knitting. 
And you should be asking yourself, who threw that coin back into the carriage? We know that the Marquis threw a gold coin to Gaspard. We know that he threw a gold coin to Mr. Defarge. And yet, when the Marquis sticks his head out the carriage to see who threw it back, uh, Gaspard, the father of the child, is, is on the pavement, I guess, uh, still mourning his son. And Mr. Defarge is leaned down beside Gaspard. And the only person who's standing is uh, Mrs. Defarge, and she's knitting. And I absolutely love the last bit of this chapter. Watch how the Marquis responds. We were dogs, said the Marquis, but smoothly and with an unchanged front, except as to the spots on his nose. I would ride over any of your very willingly and exterminate you from the earth. If I knew which rascal threw at the carriage, and if that brigand was sufficiently near it, he should be crushed under the wheels. So while he calls them dogs, notice that he continues this, um, this animal imagery of rats. How do we know that? That's because there's one particular word in that sentence that begins, I would ride over any of you. He uses something associated with rats in that sentence. And then he goes on to say, if I knew which person threw that gold coin into this carriage, I would ride over him and crush him beneath the wheels. Now, after he says this, after the person in the wrong is, is the one who makes these inflammatory remarks, notice how the people react. All of the people, except for one person, react the same with cowardice and uh, you'll see. So coward was their condition and so long and hard their experience of what such a man could do to them within the law and beyond it that not a voice or a hand or even an eye was raised. Among the men, not one. But the woman who stood knitting looked up steadily and looked the Marquis in the face. Underline that sentence. The woman who stood knitting looked up steadily and looked the Marquis in the face. Now you've got to picture this to see how, how amazing this woman is. Uh, Every single person has their heads down, except hers. And she's just looking at him in the face. Uh, it was not for his dignity to notice it. His contemptuous eyes passed over her and over all the other rats. And he leaned back in his seat again and gave the word, go on. So notice that he looks away first. He saw this woman looking at him but she is so far beneath him, he's not going to dignify her with a conversation. He looks away first, and boy, she shows amazing courage. He was driven on, and other carriages came whirling by in quick succession. The minister, the state projector, the farmer general, the doctor, the lawyer, the ecclesiastic, the grand opera, the comedy, the whole fancy ball in a bright, continuous flow. The rats. the rats had crept out of their holes to look on, and they remained looking on for hours. Soldiers and police often passing between them and the spectacle, and making a barrier behind which they slunk, and through which they peeped. The father had long ago taken up his bundle and hidden himself away with it, when the women who attended the bundle, while it lay on the base of the fountain, sat there watching the running of the water, and the rolling of the fancy wall. When the one woman who had stood conspicuous, knitting, still knitted on with the steadfastness of faith. Please underline that. Still knitted on with the steadfastness of fate. I will tell you something really cool about her knitting later, but that, that line is going to be very important. The water of the fountain ran. The swift river ran. The day ran into evening. So much life in the city ran into death, according to rule. Time and tide waited for no man. The rats were sleeping close together in their dark holes again. The fancy ball was lighted up at supper. All things ran their course. Okay, so that's the end of chapter seven.